Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this morning, Father. I thank you for the fellow believers that are here today, Father. I pray that the message that uh, I bring forth, Father, that your word will um, minister, will build us up, will edify us, will find a place in the inner man of our being that will reflect to the mind and guide us through our daily activities. Father, we thank you for um, the service out, Bible conference out at Helpers of Majoy ministry in San Juan Capistrano, John Verstegan's church. Um, I know that they're having a great time out there listening to all the different messages, and I believe Rick is um, delivering his part of that message today. And Father, we just pray that you would continue to watch over all of us and that you lead us and guide us by your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That was a great message you uh, shared with us this morning. Billy, I want to thank you for that. Uh, I know you was nervous, as I'm nervous. It's not an easy thing being up in front of the, everybody. And you did a really good job. And um, there is a lot of confusion of the two Gospels if, if you don't rightly divide. And it, it will keep you in such a state of confusion. You know, I, I turn on the TV, and at night I'll just flip over to the religious channel, and I'll just listen to some of the stuff that they're talking about. My wife will come in the bedroom she goes what are you doing on that channel I says you know I just can't believe what these people are telling these people but I was there one time you know and I was believing every bit of it and um, now I'm I'm always trying to direct people to the right way and um, it's not easy like Billy said this morning you can you can lead a, a horse to water but you can't make him drink you know but hopefully over time and 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 patience that you can nurture the person to where they realize what they believe in is air and that they'll come over to the realization of um, rightly dividing to really understand the Word of God. God didn't give a gospel to where we couldn't understand it. You know, He knew us mere humans was going to need all the help we could get. And that's why He provided, He preserved the Word of God through the King James Bible. No one, He designed us created us. He knew exactly what we needed to get through life and making daily decisions. Um, and, I, and I'm thankful for him making that plan, his design, and that it takes a lot more weight off of me, that I just need to recognize this is his word of God. It's the true word of God. And that when I follow Romans through Philemon, and I believe that, that there's a building, an edifice being built in our inner man that's going to lead us and guide us. Um, yesterday was Valentine's Day, a very popular day amongst couples. Um, I think I rated okay, huh? <laughs> so, anyway, this, this morning's message is in Philippians 1 21. A little verse tucked in there that Paul shared in, in this past week. The past couple of weeks have been kind of a challenge with me, and, and I'll share a little bit later um, some of the things I've experienced. And um, when I was reading this verse in the middle of the week, it just kind of popped out at me. And, and um, so I kind of put the message together based on what I'd been going through. Uh, Philippians 1.24. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Paul was saying this to the Philippians, and he was basically saying that you know, he was in a, the verse preceding that. It says, For I am in a, in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. You know, our destiny is heaven. You know, the, we're just merely passing through here. Our destiny, our hope is, is heaven. But while we're here, we've got some things to do. And Paul was in a, in a crossroads, he wanted to be with the Lord. All that he had gone through, all that he had experienced, he wanted to be with the Lord. But he says in verse 24, Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And I thought that was kind of interesting as I was thinking, is it more needful for me to dwell in the flesh today? You know? And then I started ask, asking some questions. You know, am I involved in people's lives to where that would be better for me? Just would I be missed? Would someone say, you know what, Keith's created a void because he's not around, you know? Someone else say, you know, I miss Keith because he was always doing this for me or something. So I had some questions. You know, Paul knew his value, his position, his vocation. 
You know, he was made an apostle after the risen Christ Jesus and given the dispensation of the Grace of God Commission. So Paul knew his vocation. He knew that he had kind of like some marching orders to do. He recognized in every one of his epistles an apostle of Jesus Christ. He gave the credentials to Jesus Christ making him an apostle. That it wasn't just something that one day on the road to Damascus he decided to become an apostle with this other message, this other gospel that was given to him. It was the risen Christ Jesus that gave him that um, position. Do we know our position today? Can we honestly look at our, at our daily activities and recognize what our position is in the body of Christ today? In our interactivity with family, friends, our sports activities, our whatever we're involved in, do we really know the impact that we have in our community, family, friends, what have you? Do you know someone that benefits from your life? Do you know someone that benefits from your ministry? Do you know someone that benefits from your kindness? Do you know someone that benefits from your generosity? Do you know someone that benefits from your friendship? Do you know someone that benefits because you stop and give a bended ear? Excuse me, a little emotional this morning. Do you know someone that is inspired by who you are in Christ? You know, I'm not trying to be an emo- motiv- motivational speaker. That is not what I'm trying to be. I'm just throwing this out there. And we could say, well, Keith, no, but I would like to answer yes to all those questions. But in the midst of answering yes to those questions, are you going to be an initiator or are you going to be a re- responder? Because we can all become religious and say, okay, let's go out and be, let's do these bullet points I've got listed here today. You know, I'm going to be a friend to this person. I'm going to be generous to this person today. And at the end of the day, you say, well, I accomplished that. Now I feel good about myself. Rah, rah. And then in the, the rapture, when the old fire is put to the, what we've done, it's all going to get burned up. Why? Because it wasn't motivated by grace. It was motivated out of the mind of thinking, well, I need to do this, I need to do this. We're free from the law. You know, the lady that won that Powerball, the $540 million Powerball the other day, there was one lady that won $100 million. There was five winners. She got $100 million. She was unemployed, had two kids. I think she was single. And the one kid had major medical bills. And she won $100 million, $118 million, I think it was. And the, one of the first things she says, she says, I'm going to give the church 10% of my tithe because God allowed me to win the Powerball. And I was telling Debbie the story. And Debbie says, well, God ain't allowed me to win it. You know, but she says you got to play it too to to win it. And she normally, when it gets that big, she'll go and buy one ticket. You know, and I told I always tell her I said, well, if you're gonna buy one, you gotta you buy, at least buy five. You know, because then you increase your your odds. You know, because one is not very many. But anyway, I, I just thought it interesting. This this lady, you know, she meant well, she means well, but so many people are underneath of the ten percent tithe, which was real really Israel's program, that God today in the dispensation of the grace of God desires a cheerful giver. You know, determining your own hearts what you're able to give, not to, not to let the kids go um, without their medical needs or food or, or raiment or what, what have you. But when I was thinking about this thing, nevertheless to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And I, I was just kind of challenging myself with that, with that verse. Um, I'm not saying this to put condemnation on you. I'm not saying this to put a guilt trip on you. I'm not trying to motivate you. I'm not trying to discourage you. I just shared that, that verse because it kind of, when I read it, it just kind of, I, I got to thinking. And when I get to thinking, look out. So <laughs> Ephesians 4.1, Paul talks about, Paul knew his, his vocation. He knew his position. He knew his value. Um, it was all strictly based on the grace of God. He, it, it was nothing about Paul. Um, but in Ephesians 4.1, Paul says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Paul knew 
The vocation, definition of vocation is a calling by the will of God or the bestowment of God's distinguishing grace upon a person. The dispensation of the grace of God is the vocation that's been placed upon us because we're operating in the dispensation of the grace of God, strictly by grace. We're not underneath of the kingdom program. It's the dispensation of the grace of God. And all of our conduct in our vocation needs to be based and mindset upon the grace of God. That's where in verse 2 it says, With all loneliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. In 2 Thessalonians 2 4, it talks about our calling. And I've read this verse probably every time I've been up here. Um, 2 Thessalonians 2 4. It's 1 Thessalonians 2 4, I think. Two fourteen, excuse me. Second Thessalonians two fourteen. Second Thessalonians two fourteen. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how all of us were called. We we heard the gospel. Someone either shared the gospel or we read the gospel in, in the Bible, and we responded to that. We're saying, you know what? I need Christ. I believe this gospel. That's how we were called. It wasn't an audible voice from heaven, hopefully, that, that called you. It was the gospel, the good news, the dispensation of the grace of God. In 1 Thessalonians 2.12, 1 Thessalonians 2.12, Paul says, That ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. And 2 Timothy 1.9, 2 Timothy 1.9, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. So our vocation surrounds a calling. That vocation also is a gospel, and that gospel is also a good news. So if we have a gospel that means, gospel means good news, we should be telling people about the good news. Christ compels us. That good news in, I, I was talking to one of the brothers that was here at the first hour, and um, he struggled. He, he's been struggling, he told me, you know, and he says, you know, Keith, he said, I just kind of just got away from stuff, you know, and it's easy. The world, you know, as Billy was talking this morning, the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the hearts and minds of people. He's got an agenda. He's working overtime. To get as many as he can perverting the word of God with all these new translations making worldly things so enticing to where we're pursuing all those things and I was telling him I said you know what I said it's easy to get to work and the next thing you know everything's work verbiage and nothing about the gospel and here you your vocation your calling is contained you've got a good you've got good news to share but it gets Diminish. It gets suppressed. Why? Because our focus. A lot of times, the only way we're compelled, and, and, I, and I don't want to be motivating anyone. I want the word to where you're responding to the word. And there is a big difference. You can initiate it or you can be a responder. An initiator, you go into a bookstore and you'll see spiritual burnout books. You think, well, how can the spirit be burned out? You know, how can the Holy Spirit be burned out? That spirit can't be burned out. What it is is these pastors that have been so much involved in initiating, 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 they just get exhausted. But if you're compelled by the Word of God in the inner being, there ain't no burnout. Look at Apostle Paul. Man, if, I, if, if he would have been an initiator of the dispensation of the grace of God, I think the first whooping he got with a cat of nine tails, he would have been going the other direction. But he wasn't. And when you think about that, 40 lashes save one. Not once, several times. Beaten with rods. Not once, several times. I mean, I'm not one to get beat on with, with anything, you know. 
and he, he did not refrain from preaching that gospel. Why? Because it wasn't about Paul. It was about that message in that inner man of Paul that compelled him to do what he did and the grace of God sustained him through every single step that he walked. And in the midst of all that he went through, Paul even says, the Lord, the Lord delivered me out of all them. And I'm thinking, well, getting whipped by a cat of nine tails, 39 latches, it don't sound to me like he got delivered out of it. You know? But it, that's how, that's Paul's mindset. But it wasn't Paul. It was the grace of God that sustained Paul. In the midst of Paul waiting ex execution in 2 Timothy, he mentions a person, and I don't know how to pronounce this guy's name, and that's Anessa Forus, is it? Anessa Forus? Anessa Forus? Anessa Anyway, you, you put your own interpretation on the pronunciation of but it's in 2 Timothy 1, uh, 16. 2 Timothy 1, 16. I think I had it once. And that's for us, something like that. But anyway, close enough. We all know who I'm talking about. In, in 2 Timothy 1, 16, the, the, Paul said, The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus. For us, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. Now, Paul's talking to Timothy. Paul's awaiting execution. And in the midst of Paul thinking about facing execution, he brings up this person. And he said he often refreshed me, diligently sought me out, oft means frequently, refresh, invigorated, revived, cheered. And in the midst of him being under house arrest, in chains, Paul said, this person wasn't ashamed of him. You know, I'm sure there was the, the status quo that, oh, you went to visit Paul. Isn't he in prison? Isn't he bound? Isn't he under arrest or something? And how, why would you go to a, a criminal, you know? He wasn't ashamed of that. And Paul remembered that. And it also, it's also interesting that how he mentions this person's house. It shows that this person's house, you know, is in reference to like-mindedness, that there wasn't a split. He doesn't just mention him. He mentions, it would be like if someone talked about me and they said, well, Keith and Debbie have really done this, rather than just saying, Keith's done this, you know. It would reflect to the household or, or the White's household or something like that. It would reflect the whole. I found that interesting. You know, in some households, there's division. The husband may not have the interest in spiritual things that the wife does. Or the wife may have not have the spiritual interests that the husband has. But in this person that Paul mentions, he mentions the house, that they were like-minded. I got a call earlier this week from a, from a young lady, and, and she was disturbed about her husband and how things weren't um, going right, abuse. And I said, you don't have to put up with that abuse. You need to get out of that. And she was feeling bad about that. I said, you're not, you're not mandated to, to be a part of that abuse. You know, if your husband's abusing, you get out of that house right now and don't feel one bit guilty. She was feeling guilty. She was feeling that, feeling that she disobeyed God. I says, get out. And she did, you know. And they're working on getting things patched up. But that particular family wasn't together. There was a division there. But Anesiphorus, his whole house is mentioned. If you look at the verse in front of this verse of 2 Timothy 1, 16, there's a verse that Paul says, This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are 
Phygelus and Hermogenes. Here in the midst of Paul, in prison, all of Asia has abandoned him, the message, turned away from him, and then the next verse, he talks about this house, Onesiphorus. I find that is interesting that he, he didn't just dwell on the negative. How many times in, in our own lives can the negative be so powerful that they drowned out the good, the good things? Paul just touched on that one verse. They've all abandoned me. And then he jumps on this other verse about this person here and he's recognizing this house of Onesiphorus. I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, earlier last week, I was at work and I was going down the hall to the restroom in the morning and a young lady was coming to work and we had our usual greetings and, and um, they led to further conversation a couple stories levels down in a, in a staircase and, and uh, she confided in with me that um, she was in, she'd left her boyfriend in an abusive relationship. She now no longer had a car. She um, was staying with some friends because she just grabbed what, what little she could, and she was staying with some friends that wasn't in the best neighborhood. Um, and she had some legal issues that were pending. Had a lot of stuff on her plate. You know, and the tears were running down her face, and, and um, I really I knew that she needed some help. So I extended myself. I said, you know, I... I worked for a lady that for five years ago, I worked a couple years for a lady after I finished my other job on doing a lot of masonry work in her backyard. And I knew she was an attorney in the valley. And I said, you know, I'm, I'll call her and see if we can't, if she can't recommend an attorney um, that's decent, reasonable for your particular situation. And uh, she was appreciative of that. And... Um, she was able to, I called this lady that I knew that was an attorney, and she answered, I think, third or fourth call, and we talked probably for 20 minutes because we hadn't talked for probably five years, and, you know, come to find out she had broke her neck up in Flagstaff at Snowballs, so she had last June, and I was telling her about my collarbone break on the, on the bike ride down by the Tempe Town Lake last year, and you know, and then finally I said, well, the reason I was calling is I've got a coworker that um, doesn't have a lot of money and is in need of a, a lawyer and I uh, want to know if you can give me a recommendation. Man, name shot right out and a phone number. And I said, good, this is good, you know. So I, I get to work and I share the guy with um, the girl and, and um, she says, you know, I'm going to call. And so she called and didn't have enough money and so she got with her dad and so she was going to go look for lawyers last week. And um, after the second attorney, she realized, you know, I'm going to call the first one and see if we can't work something out. So with her dad and stuff, they, they come and got a cashier's check, $3,000. Met Her and her mom met the attorney. And the minute they gave, her, gave him the cashier's check, things just changed for the worse. And she wanted her money back. Well, he's gone now. So I get a text that night. Key, things have really gone bad here. Can you please call me ASAP? And, you know, and I'm thinking, what's going on? You know, so I call her, and she's just on panic mode. You know, he come, and we just don't have a good feeling. He, he kind of reneged on what he, we thought we was hiring him for the minute he got the check. I says, you know what? I says, everything's going to work out. I says, I'll, I'll call the lady that recommended it, you know. And Debbie's thinking, Keith, what did you get yourself into? <laughs> I'm thinking in my mind. Oh, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. We got a recommendation from this lady I worked with. I called her and left voicemail twice that night. No call back. Next morning, I turn on my phone. Still no call back. Now I'm getting concerned. That day, next day, I leave two voicemail, and I get very specific about what just transpired. The $3,000 cashier check has not been refunded yet. But it was cashed five minutes after receiving. So now I'm concerned. You know, and uh, I'm making light of it with Debbie because she's on panic mode now. You know, why did you give this recommendation? You know, and did you check the attorney out? And I said, I took the recommendation from my friend. 
Long story short is um, <clears throat> no call back from the lady that I found the attorney, and my friend still didn't, was still out $3,000, but a family friend of hers had an attorney. I told her to file a st complaint in the state bar because they're liable for that. They will refund the $3,000. may take a month or so. She got a family friend that was an attorney, and the reason she didn't get it earlier because her and her mom had been on the outs and her mom was recommended and she had some abandonment issues with her mom as a kid. So long story short, she got, she got another attorney um, and then she was where she was, she moved from the place that she was staying at to another place that was a little bit better, an old childhood friend that she grew up with and um, she asked me if I knew anybody that could cut a tree. They had a tree, the HOA and they don't have a lot of money, and, and I said, uh, tell them not to hire anybody. I'll come down with my chainsaw and my saws and my ladder, and I'll take care of it, you know, no charge, you know. So I went there Tuesday to do it because the HOA was on them because the branches were hanging out. And I knew a tree pruning company was going to probably charge them five or $600. So I went down there and, and um, got it all pruned up, and then when I get out of the tree, I... You know, le lemons. I don't understand why lemon trees have thorns on them. My legs were lacerated with, I had shorts on, and just the limbs, you know, and, the, and I never felt it until I got down. I looked at my leg, and I'm thinking, oh, my. You know, just little scratches all over my legs, you know. And I'm thinking, I'm going to hear it when I get home. Debbie's going to be on me, you know. Sure enough. So anyway, they're saying, Keith, you're bleeding. I said, no, it's just scratches, you know. And anyway, I get it all cut up. I get it loaded in the truck, and I haul it off, and they're all real thankful. They tried to give me money. I, I wouldn't accept it. I says, no, I really appreciate you helping this young lady out, giving her a place to stay in the midst of her time right now, you know. And, and um, I left and um, got home, and then my wife wanted to get me doused with alcohol and, and all this other stuff. And I says, hey, I'll just take a shower and wash it off. So everything was good. You know, we thought everything was good. Um, the next day, I go to work, and she was, the girl was telling me, oh, Keith is, they really was thankful what you did and stuff, you know. And then come the thing about um, the next day, she calls me and she's crying and she's saying that they asked her things just weren't working out at the house, you know. And Debbie says, should have known the minute you cut, pruned that tree, they just wanted someone to prune the tree, you know. And uh, so that was kind of a punch in the gut. So now we got a $3,000 cashier's check out there that hasn't been refunded yet and she had no place to go but she was able to talk to her mom and her mom she's staying with her mom and through that her mom have had some real good discussions and there been some reconciliation there that really needed to be done so it worked out I was just encouraging her and I was also picking her up every day going to her place because the first day she paid thirty dollars for a cab ride to work I said you can't be spending that kind of money girl you know I'll come you know it's only twenty minutes on the, on the freeway, I wake up early anyway. So I was picking her up and taking her home to the place where she was at to try to help her out because I knew she had a lot on her plate, you know, and she's not one to ask for help, you know. So I just wanted to extend myself. And um, long story short is she moved in with her mom and then the next day the cashier's check was refunded, you know. And I, and I look back at all that and I'm sharing She'd gone to a church before her breakup. She'd gone to a church. It wasn't Right Division. And I was ta talking to her a little bit about Right Division. And then all the way to work and all the way from work, I was telling her about Right Division. And I'd give her a couple books. I, last week, I picked up a King James Bible here. I told her I'd get her, get her another one. But for the time being, I wanted her to have one. But I say all that because when I got a chance to meet her dad. And <clears throat> she was telling her dad, this is my mentor. You know, you know he's really helped me through this got a chance to meet her mom. She's in a much better place now. Um, she went to court the other, other day and that's well on the way to being mended and being resolved. She's got the $3,000 back she was able to give to the attorney and she's doing a, a, a lot better. And, and I, I share all that is because in the midst of that, you're thinking, man, why did I even get involved? You know? But like I told Debbie, I says, you know what? I says, you, you can't let someone like this. You're compelled. Christ compelled me, you know. If someone you see in need or somebody comes up, I mean, you, you can't just 
well, to, uh, you know, come to church, you know. It goes a little bit further than that. And, and, and I told her, I said, you know what? Everything, Christ gets the credit of all this. Because if you'd have known the old me, that wouldn't have been extended to you, you know. In 1 Timothy 1.8, Paul talks about the afflictions of the gospel. Now, I didn't suffer any affliction of the gospel by sharing with this young, young girl. But I know that Billy has been on Facebook, and I know that he's, he's battled with people on Facebook with Calvinism and stuff like that, and, and been rejected. And just like he said this morning, it's not fun being rejected. I don't think any of us want rejection. I mean, that's the teenagers of today. You know, kids in school, they face a, a, a powerful element of rejection, you know, Re acceptance, you know, and, and some bend to that acceptance, you know, even though it's, it's against what mom and dad would say at home, you know. I found out later that people had a greater respect if you maintained your own identity and stood up against the peer pressure because the people that weren't able to stand up against the peer pressure, they looked at you at a higher level because you did stand up to the peer pressure. But they didn't come and tell you that, you know. But I found out from people later that saw that in me that I didn't waver from peer pressure. They said, you know what, Keith, that, that really inspired me. And I felt like saying, I wish you would have told me that at the time I was being rejected, you know, because I felt bad. You know, sometimes it takes a couple days to get over the rejection deal. Just like when I, when I found out this couple had asked this girl to, things just weren't working out and to move out, and then this $3,000 attorney check, I was sick to my stomach at the house. You know, Debbie knows I get, I get a little bit quiet when I'm, when I'm troubled, you know, and I was troubled. I went to bed that night and I was really troubled. I'm thinking, man, people today, why can't people just... You know, but you never know. I meant when I went down to the prison here a couple months ago, there was a lady, and uh, I was visiting a guy, and one of the guys, his mother was visiting, and she had a walker, and and we was interacting with him at the table where we were sitting at in the prison, and he pulled me off to the side. He says, "Do you think Keith, when you leave, can you help my mom get her spare tire underneath of her in the, in the trunk? There's a tire well." and it was on top of the tire well. And I said, yeah, no problem, you know. So I went out there and she opened the trunk and there was a lot of stuff in the, in the trunk and I got the tire down. And then she told me that she loaned it to a, a guy at church that promised her that he would only drive it 15 miles a day uh, to get to and fro from work. Well, come to find out, he drove it 15,000 miles, brought it back, had a flat tire, brought it back. There was six bags of trash in the car that she had to clean out. You know, and, you know, really, and, and, I, and I said, he said he was a Christian, right? And she goes, yeah. And I said, well, you know, sometimes you really need to kind of keep a, a pulse on things because people have a tendency to use that, to abuse that, you know, because they know, well, you say a Christian, it's like, well, throw the house doors open, you know, let, the, let them in. You know, you got to be wise, you know, you got to be careful. It doesn't hurt to be cautious, but at the same time, not to be so cautious that we don't extend grace, you know, in the midst of that. Paul in 2 Timothy 1.8 says, let me get there. 2 Timothy 1.8, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. The power of God is going to see us through any of the rejection, through any of the difficult moments that we have, the afflictions of any gospel, of person comments, negativity that we may receive from anybody. 2 Timothy 2.10. 2 Timothy 2.10. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that we may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that our focus is that we endure all things for like-minded believers. 2 Timothy, 2 Corinthians 10.5. And this is something that right away, you know, after we found out about this attorney and, you know, the, the, the verbiage came out, I will never recommend an attorney again. 
But you know what? I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna put that in concrete. I cast down that imagination. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10:5, casting down imagination and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Paul was a constant opposition, you know, and we are too. There's things that we do and, 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 and a thought may come through just like when I was talking to the person that was here the first hour and he was saying, you know, Keith, I just, a lot of thoughts going through my head. I says, yeah, they will. Work will control your thoughts, will consume your thoughts, but you need to cast that down. Anything that doesn't magnify Christ needs to be cast down. Anything that may cause a helping hand to someone in need needs to be cast down. Because not every situation is going to be the same. Again, I'm not telling you to do things just to do them. They need to be motivated by the grace of God. Paul was not an initiator. There's no way he could have been an initiator. Philippians 1.11 And this is all of us here. Philippians 1.11 Being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ and the glory and praise of God. The righteousness of Christ Jesus has been credited unto us. We're a new creature in Christ Jesus. There are fruits of righteousness contained within us. Now we can produce fruit also. But an orange tree out there that's hanging... The oranges are hanging. That tree isn't struggling to produce them. You don't hear no groaning when you go by a fruit tree. It's just abiding. That fruit's just growing naturally because that's what it is. It's an orange tree. That's what it's meant to do. The same way with us. We have a vocation. <clears throat> we have a calling. That fruit is to come forth. But the first thing we got to do is we got to make sure that building inside of us is built. That edifice of doctrine is in there. That grace is in there. Otherwise, we're just, we're just being an imitator, an initiator. You can, you can go down to Skid Row, get a drunk off the streets, shave him, shower him, put him in a three-piece suit, put him in the church, and time to go around and tell people, God bless you. Jesus loves you. Everybody's going to think, man, that's a crying, fine Christian man there. Doesn't know Christ from a rock. You know? There's a lot of initiators, a lot of a lot of those in the church today. That's why we, we need to recognize how God designed us. He designed us to be compelled by the grace of God. Galatians 5.22 mentions that fruit. Galatians 5.22 But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Now, we could try to produce those, but they're not going to last very long. They're going to be short-lived. 2 Thessalonians 1, 11, and 12. Second Thessalonians 1, 11 and 12. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness in the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. According to the grace of our God. That's what it's all about, fellow believers. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. When we recognize that it's not about us, it's about Him. My friend that was, when she was telling me, she, she was just so thankful, and, and I told her, I said, you know, Christ has compelled me. It's not me. Christ has compelled me. Christ and Debbie compelled Debbie to do some kind things for her not about us and we need to recognize it's not about us 1 Corinthians 3 9 you don't need to turn there 
We are labors together with God. Ye are with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. That is the key, like Billy was saying in the first hour. You can take Israel's program and, 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 and try to mix that in, the inner person, and you're going to get total confusion. You're going to get total frustration. Right division is, is the key to recognizing the dispensation of the grace of God that we are in. Onesiphorus, he had established doctrine within his inner man. Titus 2.7, In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. He often refreshed Paul. You know, Paul, being by himself, he needed to be edified also. He needed encouragement. He was refreshed. 1 Timothy 6.18, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. 2 Timothy 3.17, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. We're, we're, we are thoroughly furnished unto all good works because of the doctrine. You know, Pastor Rick talked about the state of the church, the state of the assembly. It, it was, um, how do you, what do you say, the state, state of the assembly. And I was thinking, you know, when I was preparing this message, for us to abide, nevertheless to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Is our church good to abide for those around us, for those that find a place here? Like Billy was saying this morning, you know, he's so thankful here. We're so thankful for Pastor Rick feeding us, you know, ministering to the flock on a regular basis. Titus 2.14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. That good works, but it's not about good works to earn our salvation. And that's where many of the, the churches today, they, they feel that you got to work, you got to work, you got to work to secure that salvation. It's not. Your good works is a fruit that comes from who lives and dwells within you, that is compelled, that doctrine that's established within you, that compels you to do that. In closing, to live Christ is to magnify Christ, to endure all things in the midst of all, all situations. Philippians 124, nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And I go back to the beginning questions. Do you know someone that benefits from your life? Do you know someone that benefits from your ministry? Do you know someone that benefits from your kindness? Do you know someone that benefits from your generosity? Do you know someone that benefits from your friendship? Do you know someone that benefits from a bended ear? Do you know someone that is inspired by by who you are in Christ. And we could put it all in, do you know someone that is inspired by who you are in Christ? And that covers everything. I just kind of broke it out because I, I wanted, I just kind of wanted to provoke some thought. And um, so in closing, I hope it ministered to you. I hope it challenges you. It challenged me because I was thinking when I read that verse, I was thinking, wow, you know. I could do more. I don't want to have a guilt trip on it. But I know the more the word is within me, the more I'm compelled to minister to others. That I can't just go to, go to work and say, well, you know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. No. If it's in you, it's going to automatically come out. Everybody you touch is just like oil. You touch somebody, that oil is going to be on them. Amen? I'm closing the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today, Lord. I thank you for the the fellow believers here today, Father. And we thank you for the, the family of believers that went out to San Juan Capistrano. Lord, we thank you that you would uh, watch over them. I'm sure they'll have some stories to tell when they come back of the edification that they experienced out there, Father. And I pray that we was all edified here today, Lord. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that the doors of this church are open, Father. We thank you for those that are here. 
and that have partaken of your ministry and of their vocation and of their calling. Father, we just give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.